here, but and inside there, our little gift for you, our regala, is a uh, cookie and a lot of information about our church and phone numbers of our pastors if you have questions. So please, uh, as you exit, make sure you, you pick up a gift and feel very welcome. We're so happy that you're here. Um, it's a special celebration, and the flowers are given in celebration of Easter Sunday and our risen Savior by Phyllis Jensen. So thank you, Phyllis, for bringing flowers to all of our occasions, and especially on this very special day of joy and rejoicing. Um, as far as announcements, we have uh, a need for baristas, and that may seem unique to you, but we have the La Paloma is the Dove is our new coffee shop, and we have this open from 9 to 2, um, Tuesday through Friday, and you can volu you can make your own shift if you're a volunteer, <laughs> but we'd like you to come and volunteer and get to meet people who come in. It's not a big, uh, you know, clientele yet, but we hope to make this a, a meeting place where people can come to the La, pa La Palma, the Dove, and they might even, if they don't know Christ, see this as a place where they can learn more about Christ. So that's our goal for this. But we'd like lots of baristas during the week so that when we have big events, we can have people who know how to make coffee or know how to make change and <laughs> run the little cash register. So if you're interested, please find Gigi. Gigi, raise your hand, and she will tell you all about it. Uh, coming up is uh, on April 27th, we're going to have our church bazaar again. All the proceeds from the things that the church members donate, all the money for that goes to our feeding programs, our, our children's school, our dispenser program. So it's all used to bring back to the community. So if you have anything you want to bring, just bring it up to the church, tell Francisco, and he'll get it into the right place. Um, also, Wednesday Bible study will begin again at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays, and it'll be in the library, and that's just the door to the right. You can find it right there. Um, we are a praying church. If this is your first time, you may not know that about us, and we've put prayer request forms and a registration form on the clipboard in front of you. We'd love for you to fill out a prayer request and also the registration because then we can tell you about our WhatsApp and our um, our emails, and you can keep up with prayer requests, and uh, it's a way to really form a community here at Lakeside. So um, look into that. There's also forms in the narthex as well by the, the bags with the cookies that you don't want to forget. Um, also, Ted, one of our ministers here, wants you to know that he's available. He'll go right into the library right after the service, and he'll stay there for about 10 minutes if there's anything that is on your heart right now or comes to your heart during the service and you would just like someone in person to pray with you, he will be there to uh, pray for you and with you. And let's see. Oh, well, being a special day, this is fifth Sunday. Every fifth Sunday at our church, we have a brunch and a, a special fellowship gathering. So it's really special today that it happens to fall on Easter. And so many of the church members who knew about it are all signed up, but other people have made provisions for anyone who's come today to join us in the brunch, and um, the ladies have made extra room for you. So please just stay with us and go right in. It's the, the first hall closest to the, the door to exit, and you go right into our courtyard, and there you will see a beautiful setting and a wonderful brunch that's been prepared just for you and just to celebrate Easter. Okay, lastly, uh, one thing we do in our church fellowship is we take mail to the states or Canada. So is there anyone going to Canada or the United States that could take mail back? All right, over here, is that U.S. or Canada? U.S. So, yeah. And then next Sunday, if you need to get it to Canada, there, there'll be someone here. Awesome, that is wonderful. Well, I'm going to ask everyone to stand, and that was another part of my announcement, was the, um, that I wanted to let you know that there's a lot of more standing in the Easter service, so if it's not comfortable to stand, please sit. We, we understand. But let's uh, join together in your bulletin. You'll see the call to worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Praise the God.
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let's pray together. Father, we gather to worship you, our risen Savior. On this day, we celebrate that Christ trampled down death by death. Yes, we will each die, but through Christ, we can be assured that our death will be a passage into your eternal kingdom. We've gathered today to worship before you, exulting in your marvelous grace and your favor and blessing that none of us deserve. We are in awe of you because not only did Christ rise from the dead, but that you have raised us up through him and seated us with him in the heavenly realm, far above any conceivable command, authority, power, or control. You have given us an exalted status in your kingdom. In the one realm where being included and honored has any real significance or any lasting value. Thank you. Then on our deepest and truest identity, we are new creatures in union with Christ. Draw our hearts to you in this time of silent reflection as we praise you, not only that Christ was resurrected from the dead, but that he conquered death through death and raised us up to eternal life with him. Silently praise our Lord. the glory of Christ's resurrection and his life be evident in our souls this Easter service and as we move back into the world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now remain standing as we sing Alleluia. of reading today is taken from Psalm 118. Please join me in the bold face type. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. 
Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is taken from Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that engulfs all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. You may remain seated for our next song. Our second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance 
that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at, and at, at last he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. This is the word of the Lord. A reading of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. <laughs> then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, the, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Remain standing for our celebration response. 
On this most holy of days, the one whom men had thought to destroy has risen triumphant from the tomb. My friends, let us rejoice. Alleluia. 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 Jesus is risen. On this holy day, we celebrate the new life that is ours through the risen Christ. Through the death of Jesus, the weight of our sin has been lifted from us. Through his glorious resurrection, we have become sons and daughters of God. And so let us rejoice. Alleluia. 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 Come, let us praise the living God, joyfully singing to our Savior. Now let's sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. seated. This Wednesday we're going to be having a new members class at 10 o'clock here at the church and if you would like to join but also if you just want to find out some more about what we believe uh, come and be a part of the class you do not have to join just because you go to the class. Well, this morning, surprise, we're going to be talking about the resurrection. And, you know, if you read a biography of a person, you come to the end of the book and you find that he died. And that's how the book ends, uh, but not the book of John. For when Jesus died, that was only the beginning. And the resurrection is absolutely essential to our faith. In fact, it is the core element. And when we talk about the gospel, we mean that Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world, the Messiah. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, and he arose again from the dead. Now, I'm going to be just telling you the story that we read a little while ago from John chapter 20. And it begins with Mary Magdalene, and she went to the tomb very 
early. It was still dark. And Mary Magdalene loved Jesus. And so she was going there, according to Mark, to anoint him. But also, it was the custom of the Jews to go to the graveside for three days after the person died. Mary got there, and to her surprise, the great stone had been rolled away. Now, there were guards, Roman guards, that had been watching this. So, had they moved it, or what had happened? She went inside, and there were the grave clothes, the shroud, and the head bandage were just laying there. And so, in her mind, somebody must have stolen it. And she was thinking, perhaps, to herself, who could have done this? Well, maybe it was the Jews, because they were the ones that seized Jesus. They were the ones that saw to his trial, his crucifixion on the cross. And maybe this was the last of the indignities of the Jews. So she left hurriedly and went to Peter and John. Now, both of them began running after they found out the news to get to the tomb. Peter may have been a little bit older, because John ran faster. I, I used to run track when I was in high school. I could not do that today. A fast walk is about all that I could manage. So, you can understand, John got there, but he did not go in. But Peter, huffing and puffing, when he finally arrived, uh, was bold and impetuous like always, and he went inside. And there they both saw the grave clothes. But they weren't folded nicely like somebody had removed them. It said they were exactly as they had been when Jesus was placed there. It's like the body just evaporated and left those garments. So it says that one of them was the first one to believe in the resurrection. And that was John. The Bible says that Jesus loved John, and John was one of the inner sanctum of the disciples. John was the first one to believe in the resurrection. No doubt Peter was right. And so they left, and Mary Magdalene came a second time. And she was disturbed. She hadn't talked to Peter and John, and she began crying. And she looked inside, and there were two angels there dressed in white, and they said to her, why are you weeping? And she replied, well, my Lord was here, and somebody has taken them, and I, I don't know where they put him. And then she looked around, and there was somebody else there. She didn't recognize him. She thought it was the gardener. And she said to him, sir, if you've taken his body somewhere, tell me where it is so I can go and get it and bring it back. Why didn't she recognize him? Well, she certainly knew Jesus well, but she was weeping. That may have been the reason. But also we know later that Jesus appeared to the two men walking on the road to Emmaus, and they did not recognize him for some time. Maybe in this glorified body uh, he could be obscured. Evidently that might have been the case. But what for whatever reason, she did not recognize him at first. And so Jesus, when he said, why are you weeping? She said, are you the one that's taken the body and show me where it is? And then Jesus said, Mary. And she recognized his voice. And so she went to him and he said, touch me not. Now the story goes on. And so the disciples Evidently, they had heard rumors that, and some of them actually had seen the uh, Lord. And they were in the upper room and they were praying, and Jesus suddenly appeared. The door was locked to keep out the authorities. And Jesus appeared there behind closed door. You know, the Bible says one day we're going to have glorified bodies like Jesus' glorified body. Nice to kind of flip in and out, go through doors and windows and walls, whatever. And he also ate fish on the seashore, so maybe I can still have shrimp and catfish in heaven. But we're going to have glorified bodies, and uh, Jesus with that glorified body appeared, and he said, peace be with you. And all the disciples there saw the resurrected Christ, except Thomas. Thomas was not there. He missed a prayer meeting. 
It, you know, it's good never to miss coming to God to work because you never know when the Holy Spirit might appear and you might miss it. Well, that, uh, that happened to Thomas. He was away for some reason. And the other disciples went to Thomas and they said, Thomas, uh, you're not going to believe this. Jesus is alive. We saw him. And even though these were his brothers and he had been with them for three years, he said, no. <laughs> Dead men do not rise unless I see the scars of his hands and feet and touch them with my hands. I will not believe. He didn't say, I cannot. He said, I will not believe. So for a week, Thomas did not believe. And so on the eighth day after that, they were again in the upper room praying. And Jesus appeared and Thomas was there. Once more, he said, peace be with you. And then he turned to Thomas and he said, do you want to go ahead and touch the scars of my hand and my side? There's no evidence that Thomas did that. Instead, he simply declared, my Lord and my God. Thomas believed. But I don't want today just to look at the resurrection. I want to look at how it transformed lives and how it transforms lives even today. First of all, uh, there is Mary Magdalene, and her grief was turned to gladness. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Mark a little bit about Mary Magdalene. She was possessed of a demon, and Jesus drove it out. But in church tradition, it says that she was also a scarlet woman, which may have been possible, being possessed by a demon. And so Jesus delivered her from all that. Probably nobody loved Jesus more than Mary Magdalene. And so she was going first, early in the morning, before everyone else, to anoint Jesus and perhaps just to be there. And when she went there, the uh, tomb was empty. And she was utterly confused. Now you can imagine, Mary, it was only three days. Jesus was dead on Friday. He was dead on Saturday. He was dead early Sunday morning. And now he had disappeared. And so she was grieving over all of it. She could not understand but when Jesus appeared to her, she saw that he was alive again, and she believed. Grief for the loss of someone, it, it can be turned into gladness. I lived in New Orleans while I was in seminary for over five years, and in New Orleans they have an unusual practice. They, they have jazz funerals. So death for them is not the end of something, it's the beginning of a new life in Christ. And so in one sense, they're actually celebrating the person going forward. And the Bible says, pleasing in the sight of the Lord when one of his saints dies. God's perspective is very different than ours. So Mary Magdalene, uh, her sadness, her grief turned to God. I remember... My mother died several years ago, and she was in her 90s, and I went to stay with her to help take care of her. And especially during the last year, she, she reached the point where she couldn't drive, and then she was connected to a bed. She had a lot of TIAs, many strokes, and she couldn't do anything. She was losing some of her mental ability. And she said to me many times, Wayne, I just want to go to be with the Lord. I'm ready. I don't want to live like this. And when my mother finally passed away, there was some sadness, but also there was a sense of relief and gladness because I knew that she had gone to be with the Lord. And she was able to see her mother and her father and three children that had already died. And so it was a, a time of rejoicing, a time of gladness. 
And I think sometimes death can be like that for us, just like for Mary Magdalene. And then secondly, there is Peter. Denial to determination. John 18, 26 says, One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. It was at Caesarea Philippi, where Peter made that great affirmation to Jesus, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then right after that, Jesus said, All you disciples are going to fall away. And Peter said, No, Lord. Everybody else might deny you, but I never will. And Jesus said to him, Peter, I tell you that before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. No doubt, Peter did not believe that. But then Jesus was arrested. And as far as we know, Peter was the only one that went to follow as closely as he could. But then the other people began to say, you are one of his followers. Uh, we can tell from your Galilean accent. And others said, yes, we saw you there. And Peter denied that not once, but three times. And the last time the Bible says he cursed and he said, I tell you, I don't even know the man. And at just that moment, they were escorting Jesus across the courtyard. And the Bible says that Jesus looked at Peter. And Peter saw that. And he went out and he wept bitterly because he had done the very one thing that he said he would never do. He denied the Lord. Peter was wrecked with guilt. But you know, Jesus appeared to Peter again and again after he was uh, raised. And that seemed to have transformed Peter from one that had denied and he lost his fear and began to tell others about him regardless of the consequences. On the day of Pentecost, for example, uh, the Bible says Peter stood up to preach and there were thousands of people and he began telling them that they were the very ones that had murdered the Messiah. The Bible says that they were pricked at the heart, which is a terrible translation. It is more likely they were stabbed at the heart as though with a knife. They were under deep conviction. And Peter gave them the first word of the gospel, repent and believe. He wasn't afraid on that day. And then later on, Peter and the others were out in the streets telling people about Christ and they were apprehended. And the religious leader said, you cannot do that anymore. You have to stop talking about this Jesus. And they replied, we must obey God rather than men. Peter was not afraid. And in the same way, you know, I hear people talk about not having the gift of evangelism. And I, I agree, there is a particular gift of evangelism. But I read a book some years ago, and it said the job of telling other people about Christ is for us all. The name of the book was Every Christian's Job. And the point was, every one of us is called in our own way to tell us about Christ. Because we believe that those that are without Christ are lost. And the only way to heaven, uh, Jesus was very exclusive about this, he said, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that's why giving out that merit message is so imperative. And fear should never keep us from telling the truth. And then thirdly, there is Paul, the persecutor to proclaimer. Acts 9, 4 said, He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? His name was Saul at that point. And he had studied religion and he, he was very faithful to the Jewish religion. So much so 
And he felt this upstart Christianity. The people that call themselves the way were absolutely wrong, and he had to stamp them out personally. We know that one of the first deacons, whose name was Stephen, was standing up in the street corner in Jerusalem preaching, and they became so angry, people picked up stones and began to throw it at him, and Stephen died. And the garments of Stephen were placed at the feet of Saul. Saul wasn't finished. Uh, he felt like he, he could help God out by going and grabbing Christians from different towns and bringing them back to Jerusalem for trial. And on one of those journeys to Damascus, there was suddenly a blinding light. And he fell down and he could not see. And a voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? I don't even know who you are. And the reply was, Jesus of Nazareth, that you have been persecuting. But he was blind from that light. And so they took him into Damascus. But soon, the Bible says, something like scales fell from his eyes. And he could see physically again. But the big change, the big transformation, was that he could see spiritually for the first time. He thought that he was following God by doing evil. They realize the truth. One of the interesting things about this appearance is that it occurred probably at least five years, maybe even more, after Jesus ascended into heaven. In order to be an apostle, one of the qualifications was the person had to have seen the risen Lord. And Saul saw the risen Lord uh, here on this encounter on, on the way to Damascus. And so he became the apostle to the Gentiles. From that time on, Saul was a new man. Instead of persecuting Christians, he became an advocate. And he started going around as a missionary. He went on at least three missionary journeys. And he would go to the towns, he would preach Christ, he would establish churches, and later he write, would write letters to them. He went from Peter to proclaim her. What a great, marvelous thing that the resurrection can have that kind of an impact upon people. And then finally, from these verses, we find about Thomas, from doubt to devotion. It says in John 20, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see the nail mark in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so that's a familiar story. The disciples in the upper room, Jesus appeared. Thomas was not there. And he made the statement, I will not believe unless I can see it with my own eyes. One week later, Jesus appeared in the upper room again, and Thomas was there. And all he could do was say, my Lord and my God. I can identify with Thomas uh, because I've been a doubter, much more skeptical of almost everything. Uh, now, my dear wife wants to protect me from things. She probably tells me five times a day, be careful of this, be careful of the other. I used to have a doctor that died during the coronavirus, uh, Dr. Lastra, and Dr. Lastra said, we're fortunate in Mexico because every Mexican is a doctor. <laughs> so my, my wife, she, one thing that she doesn't like is for me to go outside if it's cold. I wear short sleeves even when it's 
chilly around here. And my wife says, you're going to catch something if you do that. And so my first response always is, can you give me some studies, some empirical da data to support that, and not just a friend that told you? Uh, I'm a skeptic. Uh, when I went to seminary, it wasn't because I had all the answers. It, it was because I was looking for, I wanted some evidence to support the things that I believed. And so I enjoyed taking these courses in what is called apologetics. It doesn't mean to apologize. It means to defend the Christian faith. And I, th there are some people even today that are full-time apologists. That's what they do for a living. They go around from place to place defending the faith. But I'm convinced probably not that many people are converted as a result of that. It's probably more for believers who want evidence to be able to support the things that they believe. The problem of doubt, and there are many different kinds of doubt. People doubt their salvation. They, they, they doubt their abilities to be able to serve God. All kinds of doubt. Mine tends to be uh, the, the doubt without the evidence. And so, you know, I, I was looking for that kind of evidence, and I, I think, in, in fact, I sometimes have to go back through all those things again uh, just to reinforce the things that I believe. Jesus said to Thomas, though, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those that believe that have not seen. Now think about that. That describes every one of us, because none of us actually were witnesses to the resurrection. Now, suppose you could go back to the first century, and you could have a trial to, to see if there's enough evidence. And so you have all these witnesses to the resurrection. There's Mary Magdalene, all the other women's, the women that uh, observed the risen Christ. There are the apostles, all of the other people that were called disciples but were not apostles. Jesus appeared over a period of 40 days to groups of people and to individuals, on one occasion to over 500 people in the same place at the same time. This was not some kind of mass hallucination. These were witnesses, and you go through all of those witnesses, and that's pretty compelling evidence. You and I don't believe just because we have witnessed the risen Christ. In fact, you're probably not going to see him with physical eyes. Now, Paul does talk about, uh, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened. So, uh, there are spiritual eyes that allow to see God in a different way, though not physically. But the most compelling evidence is the testimony of those who did witness it. Hundreds and hundreds of people witnessed the resurrection. And John later testifies of this in the book of 1 John. And let me paraphrase this for you. He said, the ones, the things that we have seen with our own eyes, that which we have touched with our own hands, that which we have heard with our own ears, we declare also to you. And so we depend upon the testimony, the witness of those that did see the resurrection. <coughs> and that is compelling evidence. And so because of that, you and I today can recite together the ancient blessing of Sunday morning. And we say, as we greet one another, He is risen, and the response is, He is risen indeed. Amen. through thanksgiving, um, through our tithes and offerings for his risenness in our lives. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, what an extravagant gift you have given us in offering your only son to live and die and rise again as payment for our sins. So Father, now we want to offer you not only our offerings of money, but of our lives the living sacrifice that is good, pleasing, and perfect in your sight. We thank you for the privilege of receiving back from us the gifts and abilities you have given to each of us. 
So may our offerings of heart, body, and gifts be pleasing in your sight. We ask in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, 
as Bernard of Clairvaux wrote, every soul, regardless of its condition, even if it is encumbered with sin, trapped by debauchery, snared by pleasure, exiled as a captive, jailed by the body, slavishly worrying, preoccupied by business, sick with sorrow, restless and deviating, full of fear and suspicion, an alien in a foreign land, every soul that stands under condemnation with nothing to say for itself has the power to turn and discover it can yet breathe the fresh air of your pardon and mercy. Hear now our soul's acknowledgement of our personal sins before communion. privilege it is to confidently enter your presence and realize that our fears of our own condemnation is vanished by the majesty and your pardon. Amen. Here's the assurance of pardon. O oh God, whose glory is always to have mercy, thank you for your grace to all who have gone astray from your ways and for bringing us with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace the unchangeable truth of your word that Jesus Christ is your son, he has risen from the dead, and is, has indeed trampled down death by death. We rejoice that you, and with the Holy Spirit, he reigns in our repentant hearts. Amen. Okay, a few instructions. Uh, after the words of institution, the ushers will release the rows one at a time, starting at the back to come down the center aisle. Once you've received the elements, go back down the aisles to, to your seat. If you are unable to come forward, try to indicate this to our servers. This will be at the end. Um, you can stay in your seats, but we'll bring the elements to you if we know you're there. We have a lot of guests today, so, so please make sure that you've raised your hand and that our servers know you'd like them to come to you. And you will be served immediately after others have been served. As a sign that we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, please eat the bread immediately as you receive it. And then, as a sign that we share in this communion as the community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back to your seat with you, and we will all drink together once everyone is served. On the best view ever, the people of God. Wow. In the beginning, God created us to be image bearers of himself, to remind all of creation that there is a God who self-defines as love. But we rebelled. We fell, separating ourselves both from God and from our appointed purpose. Though we left God, he never left us. And though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and death, God in his infinite mercy, his grace, and his love sent his only begotten son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered every hardship, every adversity, every trial, every trouble, every temptation that we face, but he did it without sin. And finally, he stretched out his arms on the cross in perfect obedience to God the Father and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat of this bread and drink this cup in faith, we do so in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death and resurrection until he comes again. May the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you unto eternal of life. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. If the ushers would please come forward.
the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take and feed on them in your hearts with faith and with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we thank you that you have fed us with the holy mysteries of the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you also that you have assured us of your favor and goodness towards us by making us members of the mystical body of your Son, which is the company of all faithful people, heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. We humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit and the fruits of your Spirit, that you may assist us with your grace, that we may continue to do all such good works as you have prepared in advance for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Please stand and join me in singing our final hymn, 118. Before the benediction, I want to remind you that you turn to the right as you leave and join us for our uh, Easter Sunday brunch. Now receive this, the benediction. All praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy, the God of all consolation. Do not rely on yourselves alone, but put your trust in him. For the God who can raise the dead to life again will also deliver you. Amen. Amen.